In the first narrative, the cunning administrator stole my vacation, and I stole even more from her. In the second story, a co-worker flirted with the CFO and was fired. The third story, women will pay a lot of money for a car accident, which leads to the first story. Make me miss out on a free vacation. I'll make you miss out on yours too. Includes an extra payment. So I wanted an easy administrative job that wouldn't stretch me. I wasn't in the mood to push myself, and I didn't want a job that offered advancement. I did not want to observe or climb any corporate ladders. I simply wanted a job. A job that paid me very well. I interviewed for a position that offered great income, a pleasant office, and reasonable working hours. The woman who interviewed me was a senior full-time administrator. Let us call her Abigail. Don't worry, cat socks, she said. Although this is an administrative position, you will not be responsible for all of the tasks that I do not wish to perform. You'll have responsibilities and will split up chores here and there. Following the chat, I met a few team members, including my soon-to-be boss, and we shared false chuckles about corporate finances. I then had to go through three months of background checks, DBS checks, NDAs, and the entire work. The person in charge of this was the most incompetent ever. So Katsox, he said, breathing heavily down the phone and staring at the now flat can of Coke on the Dorito encrusted desk he referred to as his workstation. There is a month long gap between August 2004 and September 2004. Why is this happening? Katsox. But Katsox, what do you mean by I was married at this time? Do you have any proof of your marriage or why you didn't work? I'm sure you burned your previous marriage certificate after your divorce, and I know it's difficult for me to ask you to contact your violent ex-husband again, but I have a job to perform at Catsox, and we can't offer you the position until your entire employment history is examined. I had to call my old, now demolished school to find out my GCAC scores from 2001. I'm actually surprised I didn't have a cavity search. What I'm trying to say is that this fairly bland corporate organization had a more intrusive recruitment process than MI5. And I re-interviewed for a position at MI5. After what felt like an eternity, I had to start, date, and go to work. On the first day, Abigail showed me around the office and went over my chores, which included emptying the dishwasher, transferring boxes of drinks from the ground floor reception to the office, cleaning the office, and replacing printer turner. Basically, anything Abigail didn't want to do until I was trained enough to arrange flights and track employee spending. I had to take my lunch break at 3 p.m., exactly half an hour after everyone else had returned from lunch, in case we had a chance visitor who needed to be collected from reception. We never did, I didn't care. I was being paid. It was a simple, chimpy job, and I always left on time the days I worked. A few months into employment, Abigail informs me that she is undergoing IVF and will need to take prolonged lunch breaks and leave work two hours early on the days I worked. This left me responsible for both her and my work. I requested that she please finish her responsibilities before leaving. She said I was threatening her and may be held accountable if her IVF failed or she miscarried. I knew she was nuts, so I left her to it. One year later, and everything is going nicely. I'm getting paid, and Abigail is taking days off for IVF as needed. She has now graduated to avoiding getting up from her desk for fear of hurting her non-pregnant uterus, prohibiting all nuts in the office, since they reportedly trigger an inflammatory response and ordering an excessive amount of deck of coffee on business time. Caffeine seemed to be harmful to non-existent children. Therefore, she was the only one who could drink. I then had the opportunity to travel to Thailand for 10 days for free on an all-expenses-paid holiday. I was desperate to travel, so I submitted a holiday request as soon as possible, as the trip was set to leave in a month. The request was refused by Abigail without explanation. I planned a meeting with her and my employer to explain that I had ample vacation time and that nothing on my calendar prevented me from going. 
She explained that I couldn't travel because she might need to see her IVF doctor and take a week off to de-stress and receive her therapies. Might. She stated that it is in my contract that leave can be revoked if the company requires coverage or when there is a heavy workload and that her sick leave would take precedence over my vacation. My supervisor agreed, so that was that. I had to miss out on the trip and to make matters worse. She refused to take any time off during the weeks I requested. There was not a single extended lunch break, not one day off for conception yoga. She worked her contracted hours from sunrise to night for only one week. The following week, Abigail emailed me to say she was going on extended leave for six weeks. Because IVF isn't working, she needs some relaxing time. How could she accumulate enough holiday time? Because of her illness, she did not take any official days off during my time there. I was perfectly happy with this, because she was a pain to work with. I inquire as to who will fill the tasks. No one is the solution. She was going to give me all of her responsibilities to fulfill. I inquire if I will be compensated for this. No is the answer. I went out to lunch and ended up having a full-fledged panic episode. Floating mascara, snot bubbles, and the complete works in the midst of a congested London thoroughfare are in my mind. I concluded that this was damaging my mental health. The next day, I scheduled an appointment with my doctor. She advised signing me off from work for two weeks with the possibility of re-evaluating if I didn't feel I could return. Still in the doctor's office, I called my actual boss and informed him that I had been approved off from work. I gave no justification and claimed I'd send an email with the GP's note. Abigail's plans had to be cancelled because my legitimate sick leave took priority over her vacation. Two weeks later, I honestly believed that returning was a sentence worse than death, so I had my sick leave extended for another month. Again, Abigail's plans had to be postponed, and she had to leave her desk to do some actual work. After my six-week sick leave ended, I submitted my month's notice, declaring that I would not be returning to work. This meant they had to either pay me sick leave for the entire month, then begin the three-month recruitment process effectively waiting four months for someone else, or pay me off and begin the procedure that day. They picked the latter, and I parted ways with the company. She was still not pregnant when I last heard, and she now runs a consulting business from her home. Hopefully, she'll allow herself enough time off. The second story is hippity hoppity. You are losing your job. This occurred during my final summer in college. I worked at a discount retailer with a used bookstore and cafe inside. Employees in the bookshop rotated among three roles, production, sorting through used incoming inventory, distribution, shelving used goods, and cafe, baking, preparing smoothies and coffee drinks, and operating the cash register. It was almost my second year at the company when my manager, MM, moved me to a full-time role. It was my first full-time job, and my family was really proud of me. The bookstore was doing well, so the promotion included a $3.50 per hour boost. My coworker Leo, was not thrilled for me. He had been at his current job for three years, almost four. He was excellent at production and distribution, but he was often late for work. He had completed a culinary arts program but he was the supervisor for me and my coworkers. We had a staff of eight, excluding management. He behaved as if he were in charge. He wasn't. On top of that, Leo repeatedly told me that I did not deserve the promotion. You do not work quickly enough. Move out of the way and let me do it. That is not how you speak to a customer. You have to be firm, must seduce them. You work like a woman, BBC. My initials, let a man do it. MM didn't like how Leo communicated with me or anybody else, so she assigned him to solely do production. Leo didn't like it, so he filed a complaint against Mitchell for job discrimination and sexual harassment. At the time, Mitchell was happily married with three children, while Leo was a single guy 16 years a senior. Essentially, 
Leah reported Mitchell to Human Resources for anything resembling a potential lawsuit. Mitchell was forced to assign Leo 32 hours per week over all three schedules. MM asked me to observe him bake and distribute books. I've seen a pattern with Leo. He was always creeping on women in the store. If a female customer was not attractive, he would barely speak with her. But if he believed someone was attractive, he complimented her and attempted to touch her. If she flirted back, he would ring up discounts she didn't get, make a line of clients wait to speak with one woman, etc. The Leo was 46 and 47 years old, but he flirted with 18-year-olds just as often as 42-year-olds. This is critical for how the revenge is carried out. Every month, we conducted customer surveys, and Leah received the majority of negative feedback. Female consumers complained in the surveys about being flirted with, and some male customers disliked waiting in large queues. Couldn't use that against him, so she booked him and me to open on the same day our corporate office came to visit. Corporate paid a visit once a quarter to look around shop and evaluate how the business was progressing before leaving. The group included a female CFO who matched Leo's physical characteristics. Mitchell had already met her, but Leo had not because he was working in production at the time. When the corporate office came, Mitchell smiled brightly and made a point of recognizing the female CFO. Leo followed the group around the store, creeping on the CFO the entire time. The group parted ways, and Mitchell encouraged the CFO to stay in the store and browse. Mitchell went to her office. The CFO approached the register and requested a hot white chocolate mocha. I had to stand by and prepare any orbit drinks or sandwiches. Leo, I have your hot white mocha right here, darling girl. CFO's eyes widened and her cheeks reddened. I apologize, what? Leo said it louder. I have a white chocolate drink for you with all of the whipped cream you need. The CFO backed away. No thanks. She walked to the manager's office at the back of the store, glancing back at Leo with disgust. By the conclusion of the day, Mitchell had me fill out a witness report detailing what I had seen and heard. Leo got written up. The CFO somehow learned about all the bad surveys Leo had taken. Only managers have access to survey feedback, allowing them to enhance the store. Within a week, Leo had been sacked. I remained friends with Leo on social media, even after leaving the bookstore. He resigned his past two jobs after being fired from one for being late and being threatened by his boss's daughter to call the cops on him. Meanwhile, Mitchell and her family have relocated to another state and started a new career. The final story is unintentional revenge. I had an automobile accident that I benefited from. A woman driving an SUV hit me as I was backing out of a parking spot in a parking lot. She had passed me and driven into a parking spot behind me, so I began backing away. She pushed her car into reverse and backed into me. A somewhat closer position was available, which she initially overlooked. It caused a basketball-sized dent on my rear driver's side tire. She was on the phone the whole time. She casually pulled into the closest place and got out of her car. She resumed walking past me as if nothing had occurred. I got out of my car and asked her if she saw me or not. She claims I hit her and then went into the store to shop. I obtained her license plate number and vehicle description before leaving. I'd never been in an accident before, so I didn't understand why I should have called the police. I assumed that because it occurred on private land, I didn't have to. I reported it to my insurance carrier, and they sent out an adjuster, among other things. She informed her insurance company that I drove away from the scene and refused to talk to her or share information. She couldn't characterize either me or my car. Her car had not been damaged. Long story short, they found that I was telling the truth and issued me a check minus my deductible. I had my car fixed and assumed that was the end of it. My insurance company called and asked me to go over my side of the event again because there were some differences in her version. They were attempting to recover their money from her insurance carrier since the claims adjuster stated that 
After investigating both vehicles, the collision was entirely her responsibility. She informed them that the back of my automobile collided with the passenger side of her car, but she sustained no damage. I subsequently learned that they weren't sure who she was because the vehicle was registered in a man's name and she wasn't listed as a driver, so they required a comprehensive description. Luckily, I had written everything down before leaving the scene. They needed to videotape me for lawsuit grounds. About three months later, I received a call from the same girl at my insurance company informing me that I would be refunded my whole deductible. Her insurance company decided after 15 minutes to reimburse my insurance company for the full sum because this lady's car and insurance were in her son's name. She was the company's original client and added her son to the account, but was dropped along the road, leaving her son as their single client. Her license was revoked two years previously due to the number of fines she had accumulated over the years, the majority of which were for accidents. In my whole driving history, I've only had one citation and have never been involved in an accident. My ticket was issued 16 years prior to this incident. I got the money for my deductible a few weeks later. They said it was the quickest conclusion to an accident they'd ever witnessed. The son was charged with the whole cost of the collision, plus legal fees for permitting his mother to drive a car under his name and with his insurance. His insurance company has dropped him. The lady informed me that he could face charges for enabling her to drive in his name, despite the fact that she had a revoked license. I'm not sure how accurate this statement is, but that's what I was informed. In either case, the collision would cause his insurance premiums to increase. I ended up making $130 off of this. Transcription Outsourcing, LLC provided the transcripts.